paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. Everybody, my name is Nick Bryant, and welcome to the Nick Bryant Podcast. My guest today is Nikolai Kamen. He was a Boys Town student that was trafficked by Lawrence E. King. How are you doing today, Nikolai? Oh, well, uh, good afternoon on this side of the world, because it's about one o'clock. Uh, I'm doing okay. Good, good. Tell us a little bit about your background. Hmm. Uh, where to begin? Well... Um, so I was born, uh, into a dysfunctional family. Um, so my mother was schizophrenic and she had divorced. And then of course my father was in the service. So, uh, there are four of us boys and I was the youngest. So throughout the time we spent with our mother, uh, we were in and out of foster homes, uh, several times. I think the first foster home I was in, I was like one or two years old, uh, and these weren't, you know, short stays. They were, uh, you know, you'd be there for months or sometimes a year or so, and we get back with her mom for, you know, maybe a couple of weeks, a month or so, and then she began to, you know, physically abuse us, uh, and then we go right back into the foster home. So it was back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, it wasn't until probably about 1983 when our father came stateside that he uh, stepped in the picture and the courts in Omaha uh, were like, what are we doing? These kids have been in so many foster homes throughout their short lives. And about that time I was about nine years old. And uh, so our father said, Hey, you know what? I'll take my kids there. You know, my responsibility. I'll take them to Georgia. And so we went from Omaha, Nebraska to Augusta, Georgia. And, you know, it, things did not go very well. Um, to, to my father's credit, I think he didn't understand the magnitude of what we had been through prior to coming into his home. So we only, and I say we, uh, it was me and uh, two, I have four, four older brothers, four brothers, excuse me, three older brothers. So it was me and two oldest. We didn't survive in this house, I think maybe a year, if that. And that's the foster homes, and then eventually that's to Boys Town. And you had had some problems in some of these foster homes regarding um, sexual abuse. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think not to be, you know, too gross or, or extravagant, but the first time I had been molested was, was four years old. And of course, now this is back in the 70s. So to hear uh, a, a, a male child to be, you know, sexually abused uh, was one of those, it was too taboo. And so everyone kept it hush, hush. And so um, everybody kept it hush. And it was about, done by a 13 year old boy. But then at six years old, I was uh, raped by two 15-year-old boys that led me into a hospital that eventually led me to a mental hospital. And it wasn't because of not necessarily what they've done to me, but it was more to put away, hush, hush, let's not, you know, uh, uh, bring this up because this is, you know, we know what's out there, but we're not ready to discuss it. We don't want to hear about it. And that's it. And so um, there it is. And when you got molested by these older boys, was that in the context of you living in a foster care home? I'm uh, surmising. Yeah, it was. So these, these, uh, so I went to a foster home um, and we were in soft homes uh, in foster homes in, in South Dakota where we began and then in Nebraska and then Georgia and so forth. So this happened in South Dakota and 
one uh, boys was the actual son of the foster family, and then the other one was his friends. And so, um, you know, right from the get go, when I came into that foster care system, I, uh, excuse me, into the home, they weren't really comfortable with me to begin with. But the 15 year old boy will always, always pick on me, pick on me. And so uh, the foster parents at the time was like, look, we got to go in town, you know, to, to get stuff, you know, please, you know, watch Nick and we'll, we'll be back. And uh, he just, he came with his friend and said, hey, come here. And he said, uh, you know, you're a faggot, aren't you? Just right off the bat. Now I had no clue what that word meant. So I, I, I said, you know, yes. And I got punched in the stomach, got beaten, you know, got raped. Uh, I went to the hospital. Um, my older brother uh, remembers, he said, man, you're on your stomach. Um, you had to continue to be on your stomach. Um, you know, for a while you had you know, high fever. Um, there were a lot of whispers in, in, in the hospital about what was really going on. I was... You know, I kept throwing up and so forth. And then from there, I went to the, to the mental hospital. It's about the youngest patient in, in the mental hospital. So, And uh, how old were you at that point? Six. Six, wow. And ultimately, you ended up at Boys Town when you were 11 years old. Could you tell us how you got to Boys Town? Sure. Um, so at the time, I was, story of my life, I was in a mental hospital, uh, at the time, I left because I left my father, went into foster homes, and you know, at, at a young age, just to back a little bit, young age, you know, I'm not really well adjusted to society or really to anybody. So, um, because of that, that led me into the mental hospital. They said I was, you know, severely depressed because um, I wasn't eating anything, and uh, so, anyways. Um, it was a caseworker that says, hey, you know, your brothers, your two brothers are there. Why don't we put you in the boys town? And it took them about, I think, four months to get me into boys from Georgia, from Augusta, Georgia, four months to get me into uh, boys town in itself. So uh, in boys town at that moment, at that time, that was the best I was going to get. The one thing about foster care uh, that even kids today start to know that the older you get, the less likely it is for them to find a home. So you think that, you know, 11 years old, you can easily find a home for 11 year old. Uh, you would think that. But even today, that's not true. The people who sign up for foster care, they want the little kids. They want the eight year olds, the seven year olds, you know, the one year olds. But an 11 year old kid, especially with, you know, emotional problems or have been in the system this long, is very hard to find placement. So uh, Boys Town had said yes when a lot of people had said no. And uh, um, it, it was a relief. It, it was the best I was going to get. And then shortly thereafter, you unfortunately, got into Lawrence E. King's orbit. How, how did that happen? Um, okay, without... Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll do it again, because so much stuff that happened, happened in between times. So for those who are listening, I'll just put it point blank. Um, here I was, you know, this kid uh, at Boys Town with really no family and at the mercy, you know, of the family teachers and administrator and hope that I can eventually stay. So um, despite what a lot of people believe, a lot of the kids at that time, when they went to Boys Town, they had families. So I had been discovered interesting by uh, by another youth. And uh, he just said, you know, you got, you know, I can make you a lot, you know, I can, I can put you in contact with somebody, you can make a lot of money. And by this time, I was about 11 years old. Um, so, you know, I was like a lot of money. Sure, you know, independence, whatever have you. So he says, you know what, I'll introduce you. And I wasn't introduced to Larry King right off the bat. Um, I was uh, taken to another guy uh, on campus um, who took a look at me and says, yeah, I think we might be able to work with something. Um, a lot of people call him King Jr. I'm, you know, you rolled him about him, Nick. So it was, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I think I can work with that. And, uh, you know, let me, you know, take a snapshot of you, which you did. 
And then a couple of days later, uh, towards the weekend, he says, you know what? I have somebody else that wants to meet you. And I was taken to uh, downtown um, uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, and, and was given a photo, photo shoot. Now, <laughs> it wasn't the photo shoot where, you know, you put on different clothes and you go off to Vogue magazine because I look like nothing. Okay, uh, but very quickly, you know, it was it was established that these were nude pictures, and uh, I was given wine, um, you know, alcohol to ease up, and uh, it was a photo shoot. Um, so I took nude photos, and after a couple uh, hours, I went back to Boys Town, and then it was about like a it was like a week and a half later, uh, the same kid says, hey, some more people want to meet you and you can make a lot of money at this. And there are people who are the kids who are involved in this. And that's when after that, that's when I met, you know, Lawrence King. And did he start flying you to various places immediately or was your abuse primarily in the Omaha area initially? No, the flying took place uh, a little while after. Um, Boys Town likes to keep, obviously, a track, like to keep track of, you know, all, all their kids as they should be. And you have family teachers as they should be. So a lot of what was going on is is under is 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 undertone. So you can't you couldn't take me on a Monday and and fly me somewhere and return back on a Friday without raising, you know, the, the eyebrows from legitimate people sitting there saying, what the hell is going on? But you could do so on a holiday or on the weekend and say he's visiting his mother. So when my mom, when, when, I got, when I got to Boys Town, I got back a little bit, but I got to Boys Town, and then it was like a month later, we established, we established contact with the mother, okay? Uh, then it was like, well, you know what? We try to build families together. You know, let's try to get you back with your mother and so forth. And, you know, I'm like, that will never happen. That was one of the most unstable persons that I knew of. But, however, she's my mom. I love her, and it's great to go see my mom. So, you know, one weekend it was one weekend it was like, hey, you're gonna go visit your mom. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, you're gonna go for the weekend, go ahead and pack your stuff, you know, and and you know, we'll see you on Sunday night. Let's say, you know, so Friday afternoon, you know, after class, I'm gonna go see my mom. And I was taken downtown to the same uh uh apartment building and I didn't go see my mom. I didn't go see her. I, I saw men, but I did not see her. And it was always the carrot thing in front of my face that, hey, you're going to go see your mom. And sometimes I did, but most times I did not. <clears throat> so the flying part didn't really take place, in, what, probably about a month or, or so later? No, about two months later. And it wasn't always very often either. You know, um, so, and, for the audience, when you talk about airplanes, you're not talking about you're going to fly on United Airlines, <laughs> you know, and first class, and we're going to go to Minnesota or we're going to go to Chicago or something like that. You know, these were on private planes um, that we were put on. Me and a couple other youth uh, from, from Boys Town or from, from the area, not all boys, some boys, some girls, and but everybody like, knew what they were going to do. You know, um, there were drugs, there was alcohol. Everybody knew that, you know, there was there was money to be made. So in the context, when I went to when I started this, uh, at one point I had nice clothes. I had pretty much everything I, I wanted. So I never saw any cash. Are you going to make a lot of money? You're going to make a lot of money. And then I'm like, where's the money at? Well, what do you want? You know, well, I want this. OK, we'll get it for you. And, you know, I want new clothes. Okay. Um, it was done in that way. And on these flights, was it, there was generally Boys Town students on these flights? Not all the Boys Town students, no. No. But, uh, 
But there were generally some Boys Town students on the Yes, hook? yes, there were. Yes, there, generally, there, there were some. Um, you're talking like you know, three or four on the flight. Um, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I take it back. There was one time they, yeah, you know, no. No, you're right. No, you're right. It wasn't always, always boys, all Boys Town students. Um, there were other kids that from the downtown area uh, who, or not downtown, but from in Omaha area who also flown with us too, but still we had connections with, you know, with Boys Town. And did the other Boys Town students, did they tell you how they were able to get away for the weekend? Did Did you know? No. And be quite honest with you, I, I didn't even care to ask because family visits was, you know, back then, family visits was always encouraged. So there was always somebody who was going to go visit their mom, you know, for the weekend uh, to get back with them. I mean, there was all, or they're going to go visit the uncle. And sometimes, you know, the family would come and pick the kids up and drop them back off. So it never really you know, crossed my mind to ask them, well, how did you get away from the weekend? Because it wasn't like, you know, the prison system or the juvie hall system. It was just like, well, duh, everybody's going there. <laughs> you know, this is what we do. You know, it's just, that's the whole goal. Uh, one thing, Nick, like I say, you know, even back then, the goal of Boys Town was never to have anyone stay there for a long time. Uh, like they like they did back in the in the sixties and, and, and seventies, it was always to go to get them back into a family or get them into a permanent foster home. That was their overall goal. So the so like I said, with the family visits, that was you know that was that common things like ah, okay, it is what it is. And what did you think of uh, being? taken off Boys Town campus, although there was a cover story you were seeing your mother, but there must have been some adults that knew that you were actually going with Lawrence King. There you brought that up. There was a family teacher. Um, uh, I, won't, I won't mention this. I can't mention his name, but I mean, probably won't even know he was, but he was in the, uh, uh, in the Shaw residence, uh, Gary Shaw. He started to pick up on what was what was going on. He was like, something's not really right. Um, I think one of the he told me one instance was he was at the administrator's office and uh, one of the guys, I kid you not, one of the administrators uh, came to him and had pinched his cheeks and said, man, you have such soft cheeks. And it really angered Gary to the point where, you know, he threatened to kick the man's ass. And, you know, the wife stepped in was like, whoa, 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 whoa. But then uh, he started saying, you know what, what the hell is, what's really going on here, you know? And then they would ask, you know, well, when you see your mom, and I'll sit there and say, well, uh, you know, my mom was okay. Because sometimes I did see her. Not off, not very often, as I said before. So I'll say, oh, she's okay. You know, she's all right. She's living, you know, such and such. And, and you know, that was the cover story. But, you know, there was, he gave me that eye of like, yeah, he went and saw your mom. The last time he saw your mom, she was at this place. And then now you're saying she's at another place. And that doesn't kind of really make sense, you know, because she's, she's schizophrenic. If anything, she was more in the hospital, which was true, in the mental hospital, more so than at different apartment complexes. But do you think that someone at Boys Town knew exactly what you were up to? I mean, someone must have known. Don't you think? I think I think quite a few people knew, but just didn't but just turned the just turned the eye. Um Larry King at Boys Town, um he he ran the obviously he ran the credit union in North North Omaha, um, but he was a big political figure for Boys Town. You know, Boys Town's trying to expand; they want you know positive influence. And here comes Larry King and all his glamour, the chains and so forth, and money tossed around. And so, you know, this is the person that at, you know at the time that I felt that they wanted to keep this person. They're, they're going to keep him around as long as possible. Um. My suspicions were uh, that I, I, my family teachers, I believe, had already knew. And I think a couple of administrators 
knew but didn't say anything either because you know how are we getting all these passes and then um even though even up to father peter and uh i think that he also knew as well i mean he had to know especially with with father colbert he had, he had to have known father kelly father colbert they all had to know period it was uh he went to boys town in 1985 and that was val peter's first year as the director and uh, Father James Kelly, he was an uh, inveterate pedophile. He must uh, he molested a lot of kids at Boys Town. He did, so did Father Colbert. Uh, it, the difference between Father Colbert, Father Richard Colbert, and the rest is that he didn't give a damn. Uh, he was always hugging, kiss, hugging kids, kissing kids. You know, come over and give me a big hug. Give me a big father and so forth, you know. Uh Everybody was kind of like, yeah, okay, he's, he's you know, he's if, he, if he's not screwing somebody, he's eventually going to, you know, he, he's always hugging, kissing, and touching on kids, which is, you know, other fathers didn't really do, priests didn't do. Yeah, I think that there's priests at Boys Town that um, definitely didn't act like priests, from what I understand. So you would, how would you would get on this plane and I guess you'd be turned on to alcohol and drugs to kind of loosen you up and then you'd be flown somewhere. Yeah. And what was, what was that like? You'd generally land and then you'd take a limousine to wherever you were going. That's from what I understand. <laughs> limousine. Okay. All right. Okay. We'll call a limo. All right. Uh, other <laughs> other boys you know, have said limousine. So uh. <laughs> you know, you know the thing is when I think of and okay when I think of limousines, I'm thinking the whole kit and caboodle. You, uh -huh. you understand? You uh -huh. know, you got the Lincoln, you, you're in there, and, and, and so forth. Um, I. <laughs> I think I still like the limousine maybe once, but Nick, I, I just regular cars to me. Mm -hmm. It's like here, you know, get in such and such car. Okay, oh, this is in New York or Fifth Avenue. Oh, okay, great. You know, this is a cat. Like, okay, great. You know, uh, you know what are you gonna do? And would you be driven to homes or hotels or both? Hmm. hmm. I've been homeless places that are uh, are out there. Um, what I mean out there, places that uh, um, you're not. In other words, you're not going to go into a big residential neighborhood, from what I remember. Okay, um, you were usually taken to some house that's kind of remote, not too remote, but kind of remote is where I remember coming, you know, I'm going to. Uh, there would be men there. Um, and, you know, you got the music going on, you got the drugs and the party, and they, you know, they're like, okay, I, I want this one over here, you know, I want this person over there, and, you know, and some of the regulars you already knew, and you're like, okay, well, you know, I've been with that guy before, okay, I know what he's like, fine, let's do what we gotta do. You know, um, I'm not going to go into the details of the whole sexual abuse of what they do, what they did, and so forth. I will tell you, though, uh, and I really don't want to get into much of this. I, I really don't. I understand. Uh, the, there was a big satanic underlying in everything. You had said that to me before. And could could you just describe that a little bit? There were rituals um, that, that's, that's what I was okay. there were rituals there were a lot of there were a lot of cruel things that were done um, and everyone knew that if you didn't play the game you, you know you too could disappear it was not a big deal to them um, one thing that Larry King uh, and his Man, one of the things that they liked and they looked for with kids who don't have a lot of paperwork. So 
like I said before, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't look much like nothing. Listen, I believe I look much like nothing. But the only paper trail if I had disappeared would have been like, well, he disappeared. He was already in the foster care system. He was over there with his mom. His mom is schizophrenic. She's always trying from here, from there. He probably ran away. And okay, that's the end of that. There wasn't going to be no follow up party. There wasn't going to be other family members asking where's you know uh, where's Nick at. It was just going to be like, oh, okay. And that's what they looked for. That's what they wanted. In our uh, more private conversations, you've talked about people being very sadistic to you when you were a kid. And um, and that's consistent with what other kids have said to me that were involved with, uh, with Lawrence King, was that there were pedophiles that were very sadistic. And would you say that these men were affluent? Did they kind of strike you as affluent? They kind of strike me. They were. Well, you know, they weren't your, you know, uh, how can I paint the picture? So if you're walking down the street, they weren't your regular street person. Or they were your street pimp, you know. The guy that you, you know, the John that you did, Okay, either owned the store or had political influence or was in city council or something like that. This was a guy that you would, you know, that had clout. Period. And these are who these men were. You know, they weren't small peons like you and I. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look back at it now, because King was pandering to the elite of our society, the so-called elite of our society. Are you kind of shocked that these men of power and influence were just so utterly malignant and depraved? Nick, if I had never been in the foster care system, if I had never been uh, you know, through that process, I would believe exactly just that. But, I, you know, I remember one time I was going to go to Juvie Hall. Um, I was probably about 10 years old and the caseworker then was like, go to Juvie Hall or give me a blowjob. You pick. You know, so I didn't go to Juvie Hall. So, when you sit there and say it, it's kind of like, ah, it doesn't really, it's not a shock. It's like, okay, these are the people who have power over your life. That's it. You know, they, they, they can end you. They, they can dictate where you where you want to go and what you want to do. So I interviewed a former Boys Town student who, his name was Rue Fox, and um he was molested at Boys Town by King, but he was also molested at in foster care homes. So it seems to be like a pattern of uh, kids that are molested in foster care homes and then ultimately go to Boys Town where they're molested again, um, if not by King, by the priests or by fellow Boys Town students. And what would you do when, okay, so you're, you've done this, uh, you've, you've, these adults, you've pandered or you've given these adults what they wanted. Um, what, what would happen at that point? A lot of times I'd be, you know, sometimes I'd be surprised that I you know, go back to Boys Town. So the material stuff was good. You know, uh, you got your clothes, you got your bikes, you got the things that an 11-year-old would, you know, would, would want, you know. Um, and, you know, life will, life will just go on. Period. And you're like, what's the next time it's going to happen? What's next coming to happen? And then the cars that would go by Boys Town often and they would put out flyers saying, hey, we noticed this car is going to buy school. Suddenly you begin to realize that that car that's going by that school um, is not an administrator or a family teacher or visitor that is an actual predator because there they are sitting right there waiting for all the kids to come out. You know, um, and and maybe titles, maybe, but not very often. Start with a conversation or not. And it was generally, the same people at the same time. It was, it was like a magnet for them. 
Um, I think anybody who had been at Boys Town, even if you never believe one word I said, there's one thing you would definitely know, especially at that time at Boys Town, is that those damn flyers that would say, hey, look out for such and such car. Look out for this white car. Look out for this Ford Escort, you know, back then. Even Mecca. Look out for this because this car has been spotted and seen by other, by, you know, some of the parent teachers of watching kids, you know, roaming the campus very slowly you know they're not visitors and not administrators not anything and that was that was common knowledge that was that was it and so you piled back into the plane with the other kids were there kids that stayed behind or if like four kids went did four or five kids went did four or five kids generally come back hmm not always. Not always. I've been told that um, kids that went to Boys Town that didn't have a family were called pilgrims. And I guess you would be considered a pilgrim. And they were the most susceptible to what was going on at Boys Town at that point. And... When you flew back, I mean, the the carrot was always drugs and alcohol. Was that? Uh, it's not necessarily just drugs and alcohol. It was money. Um, it was gifts. Um, you know, as far as your status, um, it, it was a promise of those things. I mean, everyone knew you could get drugs. I need something to, you know, to to take my mind off of this. Not a big deal. Here you go, take a hit, you know, or drink your alcohol, you know, whatever your your, your poison was. So, what were they giving you when you were eleven years old? Were it, were it alcohol and weed and cocaine, or anything that you wanted? Alcohol, my alcohol, alcohol. Oh. That was my thing, alcohol. Would that bl blunt the pain that you felt, or were you, I mean, you've been through this torturous ordeal? Um, would you just try to drink it out of your consciousness? Yes, but think of it this way, okay? Uh, think of it this way. Well, let's say you go to an MRI. Now I'm terrified of MRIs, okay? And I used to think we were fun when we were small because I could fit in a little tube, but now it's a completely totally different story, right? So you know, in order to go to that tube, what do they do? They give you a sedative, okay? So you know when you're in that tube, but now you're relaxed. So you didn't really drown out anything, but you're relaxed, period. But I will tell you though, uh, I was a drinker. Uh, I went to one party and it, it I know you'll probably end up leading up to this, uh, where I did try drugs. Um, it's like it was a it was a two day, two or three day stupor, where it was just constantly on and on and on and on. Uh, and when I got back to Boy Sound, I didn't even know my damn name. I didn't know anything. And how were you treated by King? Was he? Uh... Was he vicious to you also, or was he tr trying to be a good cop where these other guys were bad cops? Or No, it's, he's nice the first time, but he's established law. Uh, you, you will do, or else. You know, period. You know, uh, whether by force, you know, or your own will. You know, but I have the power to make you disappear. You know, period. Uh, he would say, if you, if the minute he would go to, if even if they had a problem with you, you know, I can get rid of you. You know, they can do anything they want. They want to, to you, um, and they've done some very foul things. Yeah, we we've talked before, and you've told me the ordeals that you had to go through, and I completely understand why you're you're reluctant to talk about them. Um, so with King, you flew with him from the time you were 11 till about the time you were 14, I believe, right? Yeah, 13, 14, yeah, yeah. And was this, were these trips getting more and more difficult 
to be on or was it just this is something I've got to do? I don't want to really do it, but this is something I got to do. I mean, what what was going through your mind at that point? Yeah, that happened about the second of the month. And yes, you, you're absolutely right. It's like, again, everyone knew it wasn't we we're going to have a fun time, uh, at least in my mind. You understand? It was like, you know what you got to do. You don't know what's going to be done to you, though. That's the problem. You know, um, the guy just may sit there and, and you know, have sex with you and call it a day, or, or you do him and he does you and you call it a day, or you may end up in some satanic ritual where you're getting cut and you got to, you know, you got to, you know, do all these weird things and, and so forth. So you really never knew, at least for me, okay? I cannot speak with for anybody else. You never knew. At least I didn't know. Um, so I, I hate to say it, but but you know, please understand, you know, of where my childhood came from and so forth. I knew what was there to do, so I pretty much brushed it off. This is what it is. I want this. This is the way to get it, you know. Um, and when you see a familiar face, you're like, okay, I know how that person acts. I don't have to work as hard or I don't know what this person is. I don't know what, what they're about. So I've got to be cautious. And of course, you know, uh, I was when, when I was performing sexual acts with men, sometimes it's just for me. And sometimes it's also with another student too. And of course I always say, Hey, you know, if there's two of us that the odds of me surviving this, you know, thing is great. Yeah. I'm going to make it home, you know, And you were 14 years old and you had come back from a particularly sadistic weekend with King. And I believe you told your family teachers that you just can't fly with King anymore. Oh, man. Jeez, did I? I broke my silence. Uh, there were new set family teachers. I remember that. I, 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 I told them. And... Uh, because I, 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 like I said, I couldn't even, I couldn't even remember my name. And I, I did tell them, I was like, I don't want to go. I'm not going to see my mother. You know, uh, we don't know where it's at. And they, they dutifully listened. They said, okay. And next thing you know, I was pulling the plane this time on Eastern Airlines, <laughs> going back to Georgia, terminated. And, and put into a psychiatric hospital. Yeah. Yeah, I did. So you're at Boys Town one day, and then you're at a psychiatric hospital in Georgia the other day, the next day. And what is interesting, when we first started talking, you told me that story. And I felt like you were telling me the truth, That, but I went and looked at Boys Town yearbooks, and I couldn't see you. And it just sounded, you know, it sounded over the top that, you know, Boys, you would tell Boys Town, I can't fly with King anymore. And then the next day you're at a psychiatric hospital in Georgia. And um, but it's, it was a very strange thing for me as a journalist, because I believed you, but the evidence didn't point to your veracity. And ultimately what happened was I met some people in federal law enforcement who were willing to help me and they gave me the dates when you were at Boys Town, and there, there were the dates that you gave me. And then <clears throat> they also told me that you were at Boys Town. And then like the next day, you were flown to a psychiatric hospital in, um, in Georgia. In Gus, Georgia, yeah. Oh. And, um, and it, it corroborated my gut, but it, it, it was the strangest thing. And this has happened to me a couple of times in my, uh, in my career is I believe someone is telling me the truth, but the evidence doesn't seem to substantiate that. And, and, and your situation was a situation like that. And, um, and then you were, there was, um, I've talked to a couple of kids or former kids at Boys Town and after they were molested, they were put into mental, inst mental institutions too. And that's like the perfect way to discredit somebody. Um, so if they say I was molested or I, you know, I was flown around, I was in these rituals, you know, well, he's a psychiatric patient. 
um, you know, we can't take them at face value. So I do believe that that's how Boys Town protected itself a lot of the time was putting kids that had been abused in the psychiatric hospitals. I had to cover, to cover the truth. But remember, a long time ago, I told you that, it, uh, like I call it my own, my own chaos theory. Okay. What does that mean? You can create and put a person in such an unbelievable situation, even though it's all true, that when they go back and tell somebody, you're like, there's no way in hell. Uh, you know, I can, you know, I can accept a little bit of it, but the, what the rest you're telling me is, I don't believe it. It doesn't happen that way. And then they shut you off. And then, like you said, you're just the most person that you can't take anything face value. And we do everything that we can possibly go ahead and discredit you. The only thing about it is, of course, if you met with other victims, is that you you did that. That's only a temporary solution. But when you look at their lives all the way through, even when they grow up, you know, you're like, well, where did all of that come from? Why is this person so unstable? Why is this person you know, so odd and so forth like that. Um, you know, some folks continue to go through, you know, tend to use drugs. Some folks kill themselves. Some folks go, you know, uh, through mental crisis on their own and so forth like that. You know, I, you know, I have my own cross to bear too. That's very hard for me to kind of, you know, overcome because the result is still very, very real. It's not made up and it always comes back, you know, going to the time of the boys town. Why, what do you attribute? Because I've met victims that have, uh, Boys Town victims that have just gone down the black hole of drugs and um, really destroyed themselves, which happens to a lot of abuse victims. Why do you think that you live a relatively normal life? You've got uh, a regular job, you show up every day. Why do you think that you've been able to do that and other Boys Town kids haven't and gone down a much darker path into a black hole? I don't know. I contribute a lot uh, of my success to God. I, I really do. I've, I've, I've prayed a lot. I'm not going to thump the Bible anybody or anything. I would just say that, you know, God really pulled me out through a lot, sending people my way, uh, creating good situations to help me with that. But you know, um, but I still have my problems as far as as far as drugs. I, you know, I again, I I, I don't know. I th I think I think the great majority of us I never really had a chance to do them because of all the institutions. But in later on in life, when all of this was said and done, okay, and I'm old. Uh, when I mean old, folks, I mean well, I'm 18 now. You know, I'm trying to go to this the college thing and work on the four-year plan and trying to, you know, gear up from there. And of course there were problems along the way. I think when everything made sense to me was with my freshman year, I found that finally I was on the level with everybody else. What I mean is we were all struggling. We all didn't have cars. Your, your freshman year of college, right? Right. right college, right. College. Yeah. You know, we were we were all working these, you know, the, you know, at the restaurants, you know, trying to pay tuition and so forth. And um, in my mind, it, then it clicked. It was just like, well, now I'm finally the same as everybody. You know, there isn't anyone there that hurt me, or you know, there isn't you know uh, somebody who had the power for me. We're all level. I mean, that's that's just me. And so I was like, okay, we're all level. We have an equal playing field. I'm only really trying to make something out of it, you know, but. You know, it, as you know, it was not freaking easy because I still had a lot of problems. And even today, a lot of problems as a result of all of that uh, from Boys Town. And you've told me Boys Town, and you said it earlier in the interview, Boys Town wasn't a, a successful place, failure. But, but it yeah. was the best that you were going to get at the time. Yes. And... So you were put in this mental institution, I believe it was 16 months, and then ultimately Boys Town took you back. And when Boys Town took you back, that was the end of, uh, well, actually King had been outed at that point. Um, so when you went back to Boys Town, were you ever molested again? Or It's too old. And uh, yeah. 
So no. And at that point, did you think, well, I've just spent 16 months or whatever in a, in a psychiatric hospital. Boys Town is still the best I'm going to get. Is that what? Oh, my God. Yeah, that's Nick. That's the story in itself. So, you know, folks, let me let me tell you how this this institution went, because this is a story in itself. OK, so so I was formed in one mental institution and uh, they kept me uh, for a couple of months. And then uh, a lawyer, uh, this kid, his name was uh, Seth. His father was a judge. And so they put Seth in there to the mental hospital to, you know, to 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 get well and so forth like that. And they took him out. OK, so then two months later, they put their son back in the mental hospital and the dad. I remember the dad looked at me and was like, what are you still doing here? <laughs> you know, what are you still doing here? Why are you still here? Where are your parents at and so forth? So then I didn't have the hearing a habeas corpus and I got all of that from Augusta, Georgia. OK, then they then I got put all the way into another facility, mental hospital in Columbus, Georgia. Now, this facility was different because they were like, we can keep you indefinitely. Okay. You got no family. You know, you're an emotional child. We can keep you indefinitely. Period. We can put hands on you and there's nothing you can do. And they did. You know, we can do anything that we want. You have no recourse because the hospital was right next to the prison. <laughs> so there was really, there was nothing you could do. It didn't matter. And that was a really, really, really Really, really best. I, I have to say, King and them, that was bad. It was terrible. But in that middle hospital, aside from the sexual abuse, that was probably the hardest and the most difficult, you know, because when you got in there, you know, and they told you, we can do anything we want. We can keep you here indefinitely. Okay. That's scary to, to anybody. And there's no family to fall back on and so forth. So, yes, I, my only question is like, what are you going to do? My own family doesn't want me. Mom is somewhere else. You know, I'm this kid. I really would get this environment. And what's the best thing to do? So I literally wrote uh, Dave McLaughlin at that time, uh, Boys Town, and really asked to come back, almost begged to come back. Because I, I simply told him, hey, there's nothing else. There, I mean, this is the situation. And so they took me back. And Dave McLaughlin at the time was a director of Boys Town. So. And did you ultimately graduate from Boys Town? No, no. I did not. No, no, I did not. How much longer did you last when, when you went back there? I, uh, I think maybe a year. Yeah, because I finished my senior year. So about a year. About a year. Uh, as much as I like to say that I was a saint, that I was didn't do anything wrong, unfortunately, I did some things bad. Um, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I did some things that, that caused for the termination. But it was a blessing in disguise because I actually went to a foster home and in the graduate from Raywood High School and going from there. So and that foster care home was a good place for you? An old battle axe. I hate to say it, but yes. <laughs> I call it an old battle axe because she ran her home like a group home. But <laughs> she yeah, she went, she ran, she ran her home. There was like, I think it was like five of us. Okay, the three-bedroom home. She ran it like a halfway house. But it had its you know, had his positive stuff though. So, I would take a battle axe over a, a, a sadistic oh, I did. Oh, absolutely. and uh, Larry King. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, yes. I, I, I think she had, she had no idea how happy I was to see her, and, and she had told me she says, you know, normally I was, I normally I say no to teenagers, but you know, I'm going to say yes to you <laughs> because you come, you come up from Boys Town, you know, but one mess up and then you're out of here. So, okay. You know, I'll take that. Not a big deal. You know, Nikolai, it's been uh, really good uh, talking to you and it's been good seeing you flourish. Um, you've had some difficulties and, um, but you've, 
despite those, you've been able to flourish in the world and stay out of trouble. And um, we don't see each other too often, but uh, but I always enjoy getting together with you. I know. I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, it's always good to see you, too. You know, so uh, <laughs> whenever you to come up this way, let me know. <laughs> So, well, I mean, as you know, I make it up there occasionally. So uh, the next time I'm up there, remember that barbecue place that we ate at? Yeah, the caveman. Yeah. So next time I'm up there, I'll, uh, I'll the caveman is on me. Okay. Okay. I, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Let me know. The caveman is a really good barbecue place. I, it's one of my favorite barbecue places in the world. So, um, Nikolai, I want you to have a great day, okay? All right. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, we'll talk to you later. Then. Thanks for coming on the Nick Bryant Podcast. I'll talk to you. Bye. Bye-bye.